Welcome back ADF fans. This video is part of a series I'm recording on how to optimize the performance of your data flows within Azure Data Factory. In this video, I'm going to focus on data flows with Azure SQL Database and Azure SQL Data Warehouse, also now known as Azure Synapse Analytics. So let's get started. The first thing I want to do is I want to generate a new table in Azure SQL Database from a flat file. My flat file source is a phony set of loans, so personal loans that are made up loans. And I'll put a link to the sample data in the description of the video. But this is a CSV that is a size that I think works really well with database performance tuning. It's a decent sized number of rows, 800,000 records, or actually I think it's 887,000 records in this sample data. And it's wide enough to give you a good indication of the performance. You can look at the metadata and the width of your data by going onto the inspect tab. And you can see that I have 74 total columns of varying data types. Now these data types represented in data flow are Spark data types. They will be converted into SQL data types in the sync when we go to write the rows to this table. And again, this table is going to be generated on the fly. So if you look at my source, and point it to the CSV file. And actually, let me do this too while I'm talking. Let me go into data preview and I'll give you a look at the data. But the data then is going to be uh, put into a new table that's gonna be created on the fly in Azure SQL Database. Let's look at the data sets for the sync. The sync is an Azure SQL Database data set. And I'm saying create a new table called dbo.loans. And I have no schema defined for it. The schema will be defined on the fly in the data flow. So that's pretty much it for this first sub -E. I'm not using any optimization. So in the Optimize tab is where you can set partitioning in Spark for the execution of your data flow. And I'm not setting any of that. I am, go back to the Optimize tab. I'm leaving it set as use current partitioning. So I don't really have much opportunity with just the source and sync to optimize here. When we're reading from databases and we have large data, then we can use key partitioning and uh, we can use other sort of partitioning to distribute the data better across the uh, nodes that you have, the partitions that you have with your data flow. But in this case, we're gonna leave it just set as is. But one thing that I am going to optimize is for my data flow session, for my debug data flow session, I am going to use a larger cluster size than the default Azure integration runtime that comes with your factory. So every time you provision a new data factory, you get an auto-resolve Azure integration runtime. For data flows, that is set as an eight core Databricks clusters so that gives you four cores for the driver and four cores for a worker, and that's all you get. So it's kind of small, and when you're working with data of this size, that's not really going to be indicative of the performance that you'll get when you operationalize this because you're probably going to run against a larger cluster size. So for the debug setting, I've chosen my data flow cluster, which is the name of my Azure integration runtime. You can see the name of it by hovering over the indicator next to the button there. So let's take a look at that integration runtime by going to connections and integration runtimes. So for this one, instead of the eight core default under data flow runtime, you see that I've set up for memory optimized and 64 cores. That's gonna give 16 cores to a driver and the rest will go to the worker nodes in this case. Now the time to live I have set for one hour, but the time to live is only honored during operationalized triggered runs of your pipeline. They are not honored during the debug. The debug is always a time to live of 60 minutes. If you wish to stop your debug session sooner, just switch the button to off and the cluster will go away. All right, so at this point, I think I'm fine with all the settings. I do want to show you one more thing on the sync, and that is that I do have recreate tables so we can run this multiple times and the table will always get recreated. Let's go back into my management studio and let me just drop this table from previous test runs I was doing. So we have no table now and we'll have this created. So let's go ahead and go to a pipeline. Pipeline is where you're going to actually execute this and run the data flow for testing. Rows and files are not written in the sync during debug data previews. You have to run from a debug pipeline to actually write the rows from your pipeline. When you run in debug, when you click that debug button, you're always going to use this debug cluster. There is a cluster that's associated with the activity in your pipeline, and that is known as the run on Azure IR. This is only the one that is used only when you trigger this pipeline, uh, either with the trigger now or uh, when you add and operationalized trigger, okay? So for now, we're using this Azure integration runtime configuration right here. All right, so I think that's about it. Let's go ahead and look at, look at the management studio and let's see if we have a table at least now. So we can, let me do a select star. So I'm gonna take, actually this top will work just fine. 
we'll do a select top 1000. So we do have the database schema is there. So now if I refresh on here, I'll get a new version of that table since I dropped it and recreated it with the data flow. The DBO loans. And there are these, these 74 columns with the appropriate data types for Azure SQL database. So now that we have some data flow through, we should be able to see the uh, live monitoring on this. And there we go. So we see that the source was completed and we're on to the sync step right now. The overall uh, part of this process that is running uh, took one minute and 44 seconds. That's really reading from the source. Right now we're working on the IO. So we're, we're writing the rows now that the database table has been created. And that's where most of the time is going to occur here within this data flow. So in this very simple data flow, you'll be able to easily identify where the uh, greatest opportunity is for you to in increase the performance. The next step is I'm going to show you a more complicated data flow that has other areas that can be optimized based on the amount of time, the percentage of time that is spent within the end-to-end -end process. So what you want to do is you want to focus on the prime areas for optimizing. Don't, In other words, don't spend a lot of time on a part of the process that takes three seconds and getting that down to one second. Take something that is that is a large chunk of time and focus on how you can optimize that part of it. So we're still running this live uh, monitoring view refreshes automatically every six seconds. You can click on the refresh button to refresh it sooner than that. Let's go back to the uh, data flow uh, pipeline view. Four minutes, so we're about a minute away. Let me pause for minutes and I'll come back after the uh, the oven timer goes off. Okay, and we succeeded. I was off by just a few seconds, so it took five minutes to run. And then when we look at the monitoring view, we will see that's the time spent in Spark to transfer uh, to transfer the data was a little less than two minutes, but the time to actually write out to this Azure SQL database was about four minutes plus. That's where the bulk of the time was spent. So you can see from here where the bulk of the time was spent. Now to optimize this, you would really need to uh, do something on the target on the database side. Because if we look here, we see that we have the partitions that came out of the default partition setting. We do have some skew here. Not enough to think that we're going to optimize this very much by uh, optimizing these partitions. Uh, and since we are creating the table, we do have to wait for that to, to occur. So the best thing that you could do to optimize this one would be to change the, the performance tier of your Azure SQL database. In other words, go to the Azure SQL database here and do something like, you know, let's take a look at our service objectives for this database. And we see that this is a premium P1, so you could up this to a higher service objective to get better performance. Other than that, you can also have a larger integration runtime that'll give you a larger cluster for your execution. Now, if we look at a data flow that's a little bit more complex, let's move on. Let's move on to um, another SQL Perf data flow I have called SQL Perf One that has a few more uh, has a few actual transformations between in it. And this will show us other opportunities where we can. Uh, tweak the performance and tune this a little bit. Now in this case, I'm going to stick with the same Azure integration runtime, the same size cluster for my deep guess. So what we're going to do in this data flow is we're going to again have loans as our source, but we're going to perform some transformations on that data. So this is exactly the same source setting that I have from the uh, previous data flow where I'm just creating the table and loading the data. Then I'm going to use a derived column to modify the loan amount Field. So I'm going to take the loan amount column, I'm going to multiply it by 10.25. I don't know why I chose that, but I'm going to increase everybody's loan amount by 10 and a quarter. Then I have a window transformation. So window transformation is going to perform some aggregates that's going to be sorted by the loan amount, but the partitioning is over loan status. The full range of data, and then I'm going to rank each of those. Uh, and I'm going to uh, rank the column called grade. I'm going to call that, uh, that aggregation as loan rank. So doing an over loan status will give me the, the different rankings by loan status. Let me go ahead and give you a peek at what this data looks like. So you see the rankings are going to be based upon the loan statuses. Now what I have instead of just writing new rows is I have an alter row in here. So I have an alter row with three different types of policies. An update, a delete, and an insert policy. I'm going to update every row from that loans source against the existing rows already in the database table. Remember, there's 887,000 rows. I'm going to update them if the loan status is fully paid. Those are my three policies. Now, in the sync, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to have the recreate table any longer. I'm going to leave the table there, but I'm going to make sure that I alter this index. So the assumption would be that in a production environment, you're going to have indexes to improve the query performance. So let me go ahead and create this one here. I'm going to create a non-cluster index. If 
for this. I'm going to call it IDX underscore loans, and I'm going to, going to go across ID, member ID, and loan amounts. Now, a really key thing that you can do when you are adding new rows into your database table is to use the pre-processing script of altering that index before you perform the inserts of the updates. And then when you're done with your ETL, so essentially this is you know, an ETL step, if you think about it that way, of turning off your indexes, and then you can re-enable them by using the rebuild statements on your alter index here when you're done as a post SQL script. Okay, let's see if there's any other optimizations I want to set. I'm going to leave all the other partitioning optimizations as the default here for each of the transforms, as well as the source and sync. Very good, let's go ahead and run this and see how long this one takes. So back on the pipeline, I'm just going to change my data flow to SQL Perf 1, like debug. Okay, this took a few minutes to run. I'll come back midway through to show you the status and then go to the final step for this pipeline at the very end when it's done running and we'll see what the results are. Okay, so we're about a minute, almost a minute and a half in. And what we can do is we can look at the live monitoring and we can see that the source and the derived column are completed. That step took about six seconds to execute, took about six seconds to acquire the clustered resources. And so now we're on to the grouping of the uh, window transformation alter row and then we're going to sync that data. Let's also back here on, on Management Studio make sure to, rem to remember the number of rows that we had before this process is complete, 887,379. Okay, so at this point we are almost five minutes in and when you look at the active monitoring of this data flow, you can see that all the processes in Spark are all done. They took about uh, three minutes or so to complete from end to end. So that means that we are now on to the sync and we are writing uh, data. Now remember, the sync is doing a bunch of things in this case. The sync is running a script to disable the index, um, update, delete, and insert rows, and then re-enable the index with a rebuild statement. We are not controlling any of the partitions. We are allowing Spark and Data Factory to determine the number of partitions for this data. Okay, so the process is completed at 6 minutes and 40 seconds later. Now we can look at the monitoring uh, from an end-to-end -end perspective and see what we got. So if we look at this from end-to-end, -end, now the partitions look almost exactly the same reading that CSV file in. Fairly even distribution. We do have some skewness here. We are not uh, managing this at all. Total of 64 partitions performed within the same window of operation as the source. And that all took five seconds. So nothing to optimize there. Uh, I don't really think that um, repartitioning this data across a different partitioning scheme or strategy is going to help at all. The window, the alter row, and the sync all occurred at the same time. This the the transformation themselves took about three minutes. Everything seemed to occur all within one partition. So if I look at this, that is one way that we could optimize is we could minimize the number of partitions for uh, some of those steps. And then in the sync itself, the actual time it took within the sync processing was five minutes, five and a half minutes. A lot of that probably has to do with both DDL and DML operations occurring on the SQL database at that time. So what you could do is you could look at this and we could say, we can run this one more time actually, so let's go into the data flow and, and let's tweak some of this. So what I could say is we could say, you know, in this case, um, let's not disable the index. So you're going to get some, you're going to, you may gain some time in the size of it, of a, um, uh, of a table by not disabling and then rebuilding the index. So we'll take that out. And then on the partition side here on the sink, Let's do a small partition. So let's just do a, a generic round robin of just 10 partitions of data. And I'm going to set that also here for the, uh, you know, I'm not going to set that for the ultra. Let's just set it for the sync. Let's go ahead and try it again. So what we've done now is we're using the larger size cluster for the debug. We have set the number of partitions round robin at 10. And then we've removed the ultra index from the pre-post processing script. Let's go ahead and run this from the pipeline. I'm going to um, speed this up and I'm going to come right back after it's done this time because we're just about out of time for this segment. So give me one second, I'll be right back. Okay, so we're done. This time when we ran it, we were able to complete the work in five minutes and nine seconds. Let's take a look and see it's what our results indicate. Now notice that this time now the sync is broken off as a separate step and the sync only took one minute and 36 seconds. So what that means is that our change in the partitioning strategy made some difference there. Um, the sync processing time was about four minutes. That wasn't too different than what we had before. But you see we were able to cut a minute and a half off 
for a time by changing the partitioning scheme.